here before. I've been here for about two years. I just don't normally do weekends. But with Ken and Lisa being out of town, they asked for somebody to help fill in. Shorter staff, so. Hi everybody, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm Laura. <laughs> Welcome to the Waters Gardening class for today. It is on your herbs, bringing your winter herbs in and using them in the kitchen. So first of all, when people hear herbs, they think of rosemary, sage, thyme. They don't realize the herb is actually a very broad window. It refers to anything that's basically a plant. But we sort of classify those herbs as more of the useful ones, things that have either a medicinal or nutritional value to people. So when you look at the counter here, you might see some bay or rosemary. And then people are looking going, pansies? Why is a pansy up here? Pansies are very edible. As a matter of fact, these ones here have kind of a pepperminty flavor to them. They're pretty and they taste good. Just the flowers, flowers, right? The flower itself. You could eat the whole plant if you want, but the flower is where the really good flavor is. Calendula is another one, and some people will absolutely substitute calendula for saffron. Saffron's very expensive, calendula, not so expensive. Has kind of a bittery taste to it. Personally, I'm not as fond of that. It tastes kind of, again, peppery. I like the mintier, sweeter flavors. My, my personal palate. Anyway, so we want to talk about which herbs fall into the annual variety or the tender variety or perennial, which are hardy to grow outside. So when you look at rosemary, rose, most rosemary around here can grow outside all winter long without a problem. Certain varieties are a little less hardy than others. So if you live in a warmer area in Prescott, Dewey, Mayer, you wouldn't have to worry about it at all. But if you live in a colder spot, some of the higher elevations are out in Paulden where I live, you want to look for a variety that's hardy like the ARP, it's hardy below zero degrees. Um, the Huntington Carpet Rosemary, although it's beautiful, is only hardy to about 10 degrees. So out where I live, that guy would have to be kept in a pot closer to the house where it could be moved in. Grapes. Yes, I it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, but again, hardiness, it's questionable depending on where you live. So I look for the varieties that are hardy because I live in a cold spot. If I had something special and I wanted to protect it but I didn't want to bring it in the house, just take a bucket and put it over top of it on those cold nights or throw some frost cloth over it. Frost cloth will give you about eight degrees protection and usually that's about all they need. So rosemary is considered hardy here. Bay. Bay is a nice big tree, but again, depending on where you live, he may or may not be hardy. I would recommend planting it in a pot and growing it in a sunny room inside the house or putting him outside in the summer months and being prepared to move him in in the winter or else you're gonna lose your bay. Things like onions. Onions, they'll grow under the ground, they'll go dormant for a while, but they'll come right back after the cold. So don't worry about your onions. Chives, again, hardy outside, don't really have to bring them in, but if you want to continue to harvest off of them, plant them in a pot and bring them in the winter months. Can you shave them off here in the winter? Mine outside is close enough to the house that he gets a little bit droopy and down, and I'll clean him up. But usually I just kind of let him be. I like, I like to go out there and pick flowers those. Off, but, uh, leave it. It's really a, a personal preference. If you're harvesting the plant, cutting them regularly is actually good because the new growth is a lot more tender. Thyme is another one that's considered hardy. It can go outside, it will go dormant, but it will come back year after year. Who knows what this is without looking? This is oregano. Oregano in my yard is coming back year after year after year, but it does go dormant again. So if you want to use it throughout the winter months, keep it in a pot and bring it inside. If you don't want to worry about that and just let it grow in the yard, critters don't usually eat it. It does really well and it comes back and it spreads nicely. Same category as oregano would be your mints. The difference between oregano and mint, obviously other than the flavor and the smell, is mint prefers a little damper conditions. Oregano likes it dry. Um, there's a lot of other herbs that we have down there. If you have a question on, just give me a shout. But basically, we have ones that can grow outside all winter long that may or may not go dormant. And then we have the ones that will die when the temperatures get cold. So when you're talking about things that will die when the temperatures get cold, basil is the first one that pops into my mind. It's the wimp of the yard. Here in the spring, when we bring the basil in, that's the first one that'll tell you temperatures are cold start protecting things. Basil will get bruised, it will get black, or it will shrivel up. It's usually hardy to about 40 degrees before it starts looking bad. 
So basil is the one I say, grow inside. Now, you may have got basil outside growing and you want to bring some in. So this is where we start to transition from the stuff growing in our yards to the stuff that we want to save and use all winter long. If you like to cook with basil or save it for other reasons, this would be the good time to do that. So you want to look at your basil plant in the ground and you want to dig up the entire plant. And what you're going to do after you've dug, dug up, digged up, dug up the entire plant, you're going to assess the health of the plant. Usually the stuff towards the center is going to be the more robust, hardy, woody part of the plant. So if you can divide your basil, sometimes you'll have two or three plants in one section, now is the time to do it. So dig the entire plant up and look to see, do I have multiple plants in here or do I have one? So we're going to assess that. Pick the hardiest of the plants to put into a pot. You want to make sure you're using clean, fresh potting soil. The better soil you can get, the better ingredients that plant has to pull nutrients from. Now, if you're into organic gardening, I recommend using the water soil. It's an organic soil, and you can supplement it with whatever fertilizer you prefer. I recommend, if you're staying organic, to go with the happy frog. Happy frog is a nice soil that you would use about once a month. If you want to use the water's all-purpose fertilizer, I would stay away from that, bringing it into the house, because it has a stink to it. No problem using it outside, but inside it does smell. So we would try to shift gears into the happy frog instead of the water brand, just for the inside guys. The outside stuff, it's just fine. So we've got the plant, we've divided it, and we've repotted it into, into a new container. Something like basil or oregano, or most of your herbs prefer drier conditions, so I recommend using a clay pot or a porcelain pot with drain holes. So you got your pot sitting on the counter and you water those guys oh, maybe once every week to 10 days. Usually they're kept in the kitchen on a windowsill which is right behind your sink. So there's more humidity so you don't have to worry about watering these guys all the time. They will actually droop and tell you when they're thirsty. If you water them every day, you're gonna find the plant will get soggy and kind of rot towards the center. You'll find these inside leaves will curl and lay down and turn brown on you. So keeping them dry is really the key to keeping them healthy. The other thing about keeping them dry is you won't have the insects that you would in a wet condition. A lot of the times we have plants growing outside all summer long and we bring them in and in come those fungus gnats. When you're sitting at the computer, they're the little ones that fly into your eye or right up your nose. They're very annoying and you're thinking, how do these bugs come in? Well, they're everywhere. They're on the stems of your fruit when you buy them at the store. They're in the soil and the eggs hatch and they emerge that way. They can be on the plant and you not even realize that they're there. So whenever you bring anything from outside in, you want to think about controlling those insects. Keeping the soil dry is a number one factor of keeping those things down. Now, being that we're using these herbs to put into our own bodies, we want to be really careful as to what kind of products we use to control the bugs. If you're not into any kind of pesticides, then you can go with an all natural routine, which is safe. You just basically want to rinse it off. Neem oil. This is my go to product at home. I have it everywhere. I spray it on the dog when she's got itchy hot spots. I spray it on my plants that I'm going to eat. It's an organic soil, come, I mean, an organic product comes from the neem tree. And basically, what it does is it has insecticide properties, fungicide properties, and miticide properties. It's not a very fast working product. It usually takes about a day or two for it to, to kick into gear for it to show effects on the bugs, but it is safe to use. I uh, recommend if you do spray it on any of your product, just, just to rinse these off before you use them, before you put them into your food. Neem is what I would use. If you want to sprinkle a little something on the soil to slow down other bugs from growing inside the soil, diatomaceous earth. 100% safe to use for us humans. Basically what it is, it is um, silicone that comes from prehistoric organisms, diatoms, and basically they decompose down and all that's left are little pieces of their skeleton. And they're very sharp little shards, but they're so small that we don't notice it. You don't really want to breathe it in because it might be hard on your lungs. But for a bug, it's like fiberglass. It cuts them apart and then they dry up and die. So a, a natural slow way to kill those bugs, make them die. The thing about diatomaceous earth though, however, when it gets wet, 
those pieces sort of slide together like puzzle pieces and then they're no longer sharp. So keeping something like this on hand, you might water your plant, give it a day for the surface of the soil to get drier and then reapply some diatomaceous earth. So once a week if you're watering, once a week you might dust with the diatomaceous earth again. So that's bringing your plants in and making them a little bit safer. Now we've got all these plants and we're deciding what we want to bring inside and what we want to do with them, but sometimes we just don't have what we want and we have to start it from seed. What would you grow from seed out here that wouldn't normally make that transition? Basil. Basil is a wonderful plant. It's hard to find this time of year. If it's growing in your yard, great. You can salvage it and bring it in. But if it's not growing in your yard and you want to grow basil because you like to use it in pesto, spaghetti, throw it in salsa, whatever you want to use that basil for, I just want to grow it and I can't find it to buy. Well, fortunately, we have seeds. And we've got this new product here. They've actually been here for about a year and they're called seed tapes or seed discs. This particular one has green and purple blend of basil. And all you need to do is set this little disc into a pot of soil and keep it damp. And what I would do until it germinates is maybe put a piece of clear plastic over the top so the humidity stays high. And once they start to sprout and start to grow, I would pull that plastic off. So this little disc will go in there, you keep it going and it's sprouted and it's supposed to be evenly spread so you get a mixture of green and purple basil. And I just kind of threw them in a little, in a little pot that's the right size, has a drain hole on the bottom, and then I threw in these plant stakes right here. And one of them has a little leaf of the green basil, one has a purple basil leaf. Cute gift idea for people who like to grow stuff in their yard, but don't have a yard to grow in. Now we're going to kind of make the transition. We brought them in, we're talking about starting from seed. How do we harvest these plants? Well, as with any plant, the most succulent, the part that the bugs eat, is the tender new growth. So how do we keep our plants producing more of that tender new growth instead of the old, hardier, not, not less, what is the word I'm looking for, not as tender. They're, they're tougher, tougher leaves. Well, haircuts. When you go get your haircut, isn't that new growth a lot fuller and prettier after it's been cut? Doesn't it feel good removing all that old stuff? The same thing goes with a plant. So if you're to trim them pretty regularly, that's where you're going to get the more succulent leaves. Those are the ones that most people like to use when they're using fresh herbs. For dried herbs, it doesn't matter as much. Do understand that a fresh herb is about twice as strong as a dried herb. So you're going to use twice as much if you're using the old ones that you have dried. So we're going to look at harvesting. How would I harvest something like this? Well, I'm going to look for, if I'm using them fresh, I'm going to look for the more tender growth, and you can actually feel it. And when you squeeze it or bruise the leaves, that's going to release the oil or the scent or the essence of the plant. So when you find one, you're going to kind of look around, and depending on what you're doing with it, if you're going to be putting them in the yard and then drying leaves to put into soups for later use, maybe you're going to dry them out. If you're putting them into something fresh, then you're going to look for softer. So I'm looking to dry things. I want some that I can save for, for later. So I'm going to go down to the older part, the bigger leaves, and I'm going to nip them as close as I can to the stem. And we're going to see there's a little piece sticking here. I'm not going to use that part in my drying, but for now, I'm going to let it do its thing. And then you can just nip it off right here, and you'll, you'll just throw these into a brown paper bag and let them dry. If you want to harvest a whole branch, you go inside of the plant, and as low as you can go, cut it off. And then I like to hang them upside down. Some people will throw them into a paper bag and let them do their thing. Some people will just hang them upside down. You can tie some rope around the end if you have multiple stems and just hang them on a hanger in a closet and just let them dry. The main thing is, is getting them thoroughly dry because you don't want them to mold. So a paper bag, paper towels, a dry closet, somewhere where they can thoroughly dry out so you don't get that growth. The neat thing about any of these, if you like to dry them on the stem or if you like to dry them afterwards, you can take the plant, I usually hold it from the pretty end, the new end, and you can pull all the leaves off. Oh, this one's a little heavy. Let's grab somebody else who's not quite as easy. Usually I hold them right here and I'll just slide my finger down. He's a little bit drier, he came from my house. And the leaves usually just come right off. 
So if you grab them at the top and just slide down the stem, we don't use the stems, we're gonna use these. So I've got them and I've got them laid out. Now how are we gonna dry these herbs? What do you wanna to do to dry the herbs? Well, again, throw them in between some paper towels, some newspapers in a brown paper bag and let them sit. Or you can throw them into rock salt and let them infuse. If you're gonna put them into the rock salt, make sure you remove the stems first because picking stems out of salt is not easy. Picking stems out of a paper bag is easy. Drying them this way, I would let it infuse for about six to eight weeks and then you can just use it the way it is. The stuff will be nice and dry and it'll actually crumble. After it's sat for six weeks, run through a food processor, a blender, or just shake it really good and it'll break the pieces down. If you're impatient like I am, I want it now. I want it five minutes ago. You can actually dry them pretty quickly. Take a plate, set a couple pieces of paper towel on there and lay a thin layer of whatever herb it is you want to use. Mint, basil, thyme, rosemary, bay. Just lay them in a thin layer and then put another piece of paper towel over top of them. Stick them in the microwave for about 30 seconds. Check on them, make sure they're not burning. They should start to curl and become crisp. Usually it takes about a minute and a half. Yep, full power. Just check every 30 seconds to make sure you're not getting any smoking or burning. Then you can dry them that way. Or you can roast them in the oven. What I do in the oven is I'll just put a layer of foil on a cookie sheet, thin layer of whatever herb I want to dry. If you want to throw in some lemon zest, stay away from any of the white pithy parts. You want just the outside of the lemon or just the outside of the lime or just the outside of the orange, whatever you want to do. Single layer, 200 degrees for about two hours and it'll dry out nicely. So we've got all these dried herbs. What are we going to do with them now? Well, you can store them. You can mix them into sugars, you can mix them into salts, or you can save them for putting on your meats or potatoes or noodles or whatever you want to use them. Make sure that once they are dry, that they're stored in a, in a container somewhere so that they're easy to access. I like going to the dollar store, buying the cheese shakers for a buck. The holes are big enough that you can get the big chunks of herbs out. If you use salt and pepper shakers, you're going to have to run everything through a food processor because they won't come out. Holes are too small. Some people will put them into pretty little jars and then just grab a pinch as they need it, however you want to do. It's really up to you what you like. But the neat thing is, is not only are herbs versatile in things that you want to eat and cook, but herbs have medicinal properties as well. How many of you have ever had a sunburn and put aloe on it? So aloe is one of those herbs. You don't think of him as an herb because we don't really eat him. You can but he's got good medicinal properties as well. So something like this, when you would harvest, you don't want to hurt the main part of the plant. You want to pull these outer, these outer leaves off. Now to get to the good juice inside, you've pulled the leaf off. It comes off pretty easy at the base. Some of them aren't going to be quite as, as dark on the bottom as this because he's been there and a little bit wet. But once you pull that off, snip the end open and you can just squeeze the juice out and you can see it come out. Some people will actually <laughs> cut them up the middle and run the whole thing that way. I found that it curls. So you just go like this, you can rub it on where you need to and squeeze while you do that. And then once that end is done, you snip it a little bit shorter and do the same thing again. I don't know how to harvest all the juice to save it. I'm not that apt, but I can just cut off a leaf and use it as I need. So we've got some aloe. We, we can't grow him outside. We want to put him in a pot. Which herbs need what? Aloe likes the sun. So make sure he's at a sunny window. Rosemary likes the sun. You can grow him outside or inside. Basil likes the sun. Most herbs like the sun. So you want to make sure that they're in a window that gets at least six hours of light. So if you're bringing them in, usually our kitchen window gets enough light. And when I say light, I mean you can read a newspaper without turning the light on. That's six hours or more. Full sun works for those guys. Now mint, he's kind of the easy one. He'll go anywhere, as long as he's got a drink. The best thing about mint is it actually prefers pots. Well, I can't say it prefers pots. It's better to grow in pots, because if you put it in your yard, it's everywhere. You'll find mint popping up 10 feet away because it's gonna run under the ground, wherever the moisture is, and pop up somewhere else. Keeping it under control, putting it in pots. 
And a lot of people will actually just plant that mint in its pot in the ground, and then in the winter when they want to pull it out to save it because they want to keep it green, they'll just pull the whole pot out and set it inside another container rather than replanting the whole thing all the time. Okay, so does anybody have any questions so far? What kind of herbs are you growing in your yard? Basil. Okay, now what did we say about basil earlier? It's a wimp, it doesn't like the cold. So you're going to have to bring him in or you're going to have to start to grow him. So what about using, um, I guess, a, a blender with olive oil and... That was the next thing I was going to go into. Okay. After we've got him, I mentioned the sugars and the salts yeah. fast because those are part of, some people will store them in to dry them that way. But now we've got the herbs and we've saved them and we want to put them in other things. Some people will infuse vinegars. Some people like to put them in olive oil. Now, if you want to save them for quick cooking, what I like to do is take a ice cube tray and I'll fill it about halfway full of olive oil and then I'll put one leaf or a couple of leaves or a pinch of oregano, basil, whatever I'm going to use, rosemary. But only fill that ice cube tray halfway and then set your, your herb in there. Once it's frozen solid, go ahead and pour the other half up. And what you're doing is, is you're making an ice cube with the center of it that has some kind of herb in it. Does uh, olive oil freeze? Olive oil will get kind of hard. Okay. So once it's okay. taken up, it right. And what I actually like to do is I actually use olive oil on the bottom half and then I'll put broth on top. Chicken broth, vegetable stock, whatever. If you're vegetarian, use a vegetable stock. If you're not vegetarian like me, then beef, chicken broth, any of those things, pour it on the top half and then store it in, in the freezer once it's frozen, break them apart, dump them into a Ziploc bag, and then you can store your baggie of ice cubes. And say you want to throw together a round of potatoes, grab two or three ice cubes, throw them in the skillet, they're already measured out. Then you throw your, your food in top of that. Or you can do the microwave version and melt them down that way. I like to saute everything, I like that crispiness. I like to use olive oil. Or you can melt butter down and do the same thing, it's really up to you. But Freezing them first makes it a lot easier to store because we don't always have five or ten empty ice cube trays. So I'll use one ice cube tray, make a batch, put them into the thing, and then I'll make another batch once that one's frozen. You can also make actual ice cubes to garnish your drinks. That's where your pansies and your rosebud, they come in handy. If you're going to use rosebuds, I would actually take the petals off and cut the white part of the petal because it tastes bitter, and then throw a couple of rose petals or an entire um, viola in the ice cube, again, filling the halfway point with either water or wine or whatever, drop in the, the flour, and then the other half with water or wine, freezing it solid, and then saving those ice cubes as a special varnish. Um, the infused oils, if you just want to get a pretty jar, again, I would fill that about two-thirds of the way with whatever product you want to use, olive oil, vinegar, whatever, then slide in your seasoning. Some people will throw cranberries in, some people will throw cloves in, some people will throw dill in, whatever you want, put it in and then fill it again so that it's about, oh, maybe three-fourths of the way full. Seal it and let it soak. Infusion takes about six weeks, okay? So to get that flavor going, six weeks is what you want to use. Some people like to leave the, the floaters in there. They'll have the stems and the pretty stuff in there and they don't mind it at all. But for those of you who don't like to have a piece of plant in there to get stuck in your teeth, go ahead and put it in some cheesecloth. Take it in cheesecloth and just tie the end the way the French do it, throw it in there, and when you're done, you can pull the entire cheesecloth out. Or you can pour it through a strainer and catch the big pieces. Whatever you have made, whether it's an infused salt, sugar, vinegar, oil, anything like that, usually keeps for about six months without any problems. If you store it in the freezer, you can probably get a little bit longer time out of it. The main thing is, is we're using fresh herbs, we're drying them ourselves, so we want to keep them as fresh as possible. So you're using uh, dried herbs when you put them in uh, for an infusion? You can use dry or, or like this one here. I actually cut stuff from my yard last night. Well, it wasn't last night, it was in the afternoon. And then I threw them into the salt. This won't be ready to use for probably six weeks because I used fresh herbs that I did not dry. Had I dried them, like in the sugar, I actually dried the, the sugar and the lemon rind in the microwave 
and then I ran it through the blender. This can be used right now because the herbs have been dried and, and ground into it. Same question? Can you explain, I, I didn't see the beginning, so what's that infusion all about? Okay, infusion is when you want to take a sugar or a salt or an oil and you want it to take on the flavors or the properties of whatever herb you added. So what I did was I took the rind off of some lemons and I dried it in the microwave. So I took my vegetable peeler, peeled just the yellow part of the lemon off and laid them onto a, a paper towel and did 30 seconds in the microwave, 30 seconds in the microwave, like I said, about a minute and a half, until they were dry and crispy. Once they were dry and crispy, I threw them into the, the measuring cup with the sugar. Then I went and did the same thing with the mint. Laid them just the leaves, we didn't want the stems, and I laid them on the, the paper towel and did 30 seconds in the microwave, checking each time, and then again, about a minute and a half. Once it was crispy and dry, I threw it in with the sugar and the lemon and ran it through the, the blender because I don't have a food processor. But if you've got a coffee grinder or whatever, and then I just pulverized it. And it's really, really fine, but it's very, it smells good. I don't know how many of you smelled it or tasted it, but that's why it's here for you to see. This one was made in, oh, it probably took me half an hour. This one here didn't take hardly any time at all, but I did the lazy way. I'm not, I'm going to wait for it to do its thing. In about six weeks, these will be nice and dry, and you can just use it in your cooking or whatever. So if you're fast, you need it now, dry it in the micro or 200 degrees for two hours in the oven. If you're slow or have plenty of time, this is what I would do for Christmas gifts. We've got about a month and a half until Christmas, maybe two months until Christmas. If you make these now, you can decorate them nicely and give them as gifts from my garden to yours. A, a pleasant little enjoy the fruit of my labor or the herbs of my labor. Now, the other thing I did last night is I took some organic cream cheese and I took one packet, which is an eight ounce packet of cream cheese with about a quarter of a cup of chives. And I cut them up, these were fresh chives. You can see they still had the flowers on them and I tried to find the smaller, finer stemmed ones because the coarse ones don't quite taste as good. And I cut it up, I diced it really small. I softened the cream cheese in the microwave, oh, maybe about 20 seconds so that I could stir it. But if you buy the already soft cream cheese, it mixes nicely. If you want to have it a more firm cheese, use the brick. If you wanted a softer cheese and you have the brick, add a little lemon juice. It'll soften it nicely. You're more than welcome to taste those. Quick and easy. It took me 30 seconds to harvest the chives, about another 30 seconds to wash them off and chop them up, and then mixing it. So in no time, you have a great little dip you can use for guests or a treat for you and your, your, your family. So we've got different things you can do with them. Some people actually like to infuse them with bath salts, like lavender and things like that. Just again, the infusion takes about six weeks. So if you're planning on giving it as a gift, think ahead, do your work now and give them as gifts for Christmas time. If you're gonna use them for yourself, think ahead and allow that six weeks or you're gonna to have to do some roasting in the oven. The main thing is, is that there's a lot of these things that we grow outside that once the winter comes, we don't think that we can do anymore. So we wanna make sure that we bring these plants in so we can enjoy them. So when you're bringing the plants in, you really have to think, what is this plant getting outside now that he'll need when he comes into the house? He wants light? Does he want six hours or more? Or does he want less than that? So consider your spot. What else does he need? He needs something to grow in. So if you put him in a nice pot, make sure you have drainage. That's the biggest thing. And don't overwater. So if we have a nice pot with a single hole in the bottom, it works perfectly. A lot of people don't like these drain holes because it'll get all over their windowsill. Well, you know, there's an easy fix. It's called a drip tray. We have them in the store. They're plastic. They're a couple bucks. They fit nice underneath. And they're clear. So you don't really notice them. Set it right underneath, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. <laughs> We're not overwatering our herbs. We can use them and enjoy them, but the bugs came in with them. So what do we do for the bugs? Neem oil or diatomaceous earth. Neem oil stops them already when they're, when they're already around and crawling. This gets them right as they come out of the dirt. It lays on the surface of the soil and as they walk across it, cuts them up into little bits and they dry a slow death. So we've got that part. Now the herbs are feeding us. We gotta feed our herbs. I don't recommend the all-purpose fertilizer because it stinks. But if you can't smell, 
use the all-purpose, it's great. But if you are like me and you can't stand the smell, this guy here doesn't have any scent. It's organic, it's safe to use, and it's about the same numbers. If you look, it's a 745, the all-purpose is 744. This is a nice or, or alternative, once a month feeding on these. Different things that you can use, different ways you can do it. Good potting soil is the key, and let them do their thing and enjoy them. The best part about it is when you enjoy them, you can share it with other people as well, because there's far more rosemary on this plant than I would ever use. And it keeps growing. The more you cut it, the more it's gonna grow. As long as he's being cared for, he'll take care of you. Do you have any questions today? You got them all? Feel free to sample the things I have here. Take a, a scent, squeeze the leaf, smell it after you squeeze it, or just take it and pop it in your mouth. We don't use any, um, any sprays on these that are going to be harmful to you guys. If we do ever spray anything that's going to be eaten, we use the neem because it's safe. We want to fall into that organic category. A lot of people like that. Why does that basil look different? Basil is a big family. There's lots of different types. So this one here is an upright basil. Some of the basil will be bigger leaves. Some of them will be different colors. There's um, Greek basil. There's purple basil. There's Oh yeah, this one here is definitely not a sweet basil. This one here is a, you can put them in pestos, or I like to throw basil in salsa. I know it sounds weird, but throwing the basil in the salsa with the cilantro and the peppers and things like that just kind of adds more herb to it. And I like that herb <coughs> flavor in the spicier dishes. The sweet basil is good with, with lime and sugar, and it's really great that way. The more um, robust flavors, I would put into heartier dishes. Pardon me as I spit food out. <laughs> Rosemary is one of your very strong herbs, so use it sparingly. Oregano is very strong, use it sparingly. What ratio would you put in that container of uh, like rosemary and salt? It's actually on here. It's, oh, is it? it's two to one. So two parts salt to one part herb. So if you're using one cup, you're gonna use a half a cup of chives. One cup of salt, a half a cup of chives. I would go a little bit shy on the rosemary because it is extra strong. Um, you can tell the herb how strong it's going to be when you're harvesting it. When you're cutting it, does it have a strong smell? When you, like onions, you know how you cut an onion and you're like, woo -hoo! That's a strong herb. Chives are kind of in that same category. So it's usually about half a cup. It's nowhere near as stout as the rosemary would be. I can touch rosemary and at the end of the day still smell it on my fingers. So be sparing with him. Um, bay is one of those ones I would just save in the cheesecloth and throw it in with soups. Nobody likes to be eating soup and get a big old chunk of leaf. So that's one you would strain out or use the cheesecloth. Rosemary is one. It's small enough. It, it's not a problem. Most people will just eat it like they would anything else. Again, oregano, same way. Basil, when it's dry, will crunch pretty well. What is the yellow flower herb? The yellow flower is calendula, and that's a, a substitute for saffron. You can actually come and, and taste the flower if you want. Pull a couple petals off and taste it. It's why it's here. Any of these are safe to taste today. They haven't been sprayed with anything. So if you would like to, usually what I do is I just bruise the leaf and smell it. And if I like the smell, then I'll pop it in my mouth and eat it. So you just use the flowers on the calendula? The calendula, just use the flower. Same thing with the viola, the flower itself. The, the leaf is just there. It's like celery kind of, you know, it's there. But the flower is where the neat flavor is. The rosemary, the flower is pretty and it ni makes a nice garnish. However, it doesn't really have the flavor that the leaves do. Where lavender, we almost always throw the flower in there with it. Chives, we like to throw the flower in with it as well because it's so pretty and it adds to it. Now, lavender, usually you would use as a tea or as a body scrub or something like that. I don't really like the taste of lavender very well. So again, it's more of a tea thing, not so much of a cookie. Although I have seen people put them in cookies. I really like the sugar. It's, it's super sweet. I would sprinkle that on top of cookies or even if you make confections for Christmas.